Hi folks, Dr. Travis McMacken here. Welcome or welcome back as the case may be. Thank you for choosing to spend a bit of your day with me. I hope that I can at least help you to think some interesting thoughts. I'll be back with you in a moment after the music ends. So today I'd like to share a little Helmut Golwitzer with you. The other night I was sitting up late reading, as I am wont to do, and I came to the end of this essay of Golwitzer's that I've read many, many times before, and the conclusion just struck me uh, to such an extent that I, I wanted to share it with you all. It's got some great stories in it, uh, and it's got some really good food for thought as well. This uh, is the last couple of pages of Golwitzer's essay on the Kingdom of God and Socialism. Uh, it's translated in George Hunsinger's Karl Barth and Radical Politics. I'm reading from the second edition of that work, and it appears on pages 83 through 85, the section I'm going to read. And I'm just going to dive right in and allow you all to bask in Golwitzer's uh, thinking here about Barth and to draw your own conclusions. So here we go. Uh, so this whole essay is about the place of socialism in Barth's thought. So here's Golwitzer. We can no longer pose these questions to Barth. We can no longer ask him why the Safenville clarity indeed continued through these admittedly clear signs, yet not with the same open participation in socialist praxis, so that a controversy about what he meant could then arise. We did not ask him when we were still able to ask him. We did not ask him then because the same historical causes were at work in us which discredited the socialist movement and led it astray into resignation about the possibilities of socialist efforts and even into downplaying the present class structure. And I'm going to pause there just to comment uh, that Golwitzer in the 50s and early 60s had a bit of a uh, reactionary moment in his own life and thinking after being a prisoner of war in Russia. Um, and it wasn't until the late 60s that he swung back to uh, the, hard, the far, farther left. Uh, he had been more of a centrist and reform capital, reformist capitalist uh, through the 50s and early 60s. So going back to Golwitzer. The questions of which we are conscious today are thus not condemnations, but rather an occasion to consider the historical conditions and limitations that affect us all, even a great and beloved teacher who was far ahead of his time and contemporaries, and who, in, in his perception of the one thing necessary in order to proceed creatively rather than destructively in the work of, to transform the world, is always still far ahead of us. In 1931, Bart presented a book to his pupil and friend, Fritz Lieb, with the dedication, quote, to the representative of the Third International from a representative of the two, Second and a Half International, end quote. At that time, Fritz Lieb was already a disillusioned representative of the Third International, and, later, and he later broke with it completely in protest against Stalinism. As Marquardt has shown in his dedication, Bart was lightheartedly saying, not that he indeed stood on the left, though somewhat less to the left than, Bart, than Lieb, but that at bottom he held an even more leftist position. In Switzerland, there was a group under Robert Grimm which called itself the Second and a Half International in order to express that it stood to the left of the Second International, the Social Democratic, but did not submit to the hegemony of Moscow. Bart subscribed to this position. When, during the same period, he joined the SPD, provoked by an account of the Dane affair by Gottfried Traub in Eiser and Blatter, I expressed my scorn to him about this lame gesture, but he asked in that case just where one could go if, no, if one no longer wanted to remain merely a political spectator, since the Communist Party was out of the question for me as well. He then allied himself with a left-wing circle within the Bonn SPD. A year before that, he had once greeted me as I was stepping into the house with the praise, quote, Herr Golwitzer, I was told that yesterday evening you stood in an assembly and sang the Internationale. You are making great progress, end quote. During the severe depression of the first days of the 1933 summer semester, he contradicted every optimism that the Nazi government would soon be just as ruined by mismanagement as the previous governments. To him, it was clear that we were facing the ominous result of a long German history. As we listened together at Karl Ludwig Schmitz to the radio broadcast of Hitler's Tempelhof field speech, 
on the evening of May 1, 1933, some were of the opinion that the German workers would not tolerate the destruction of their unions and that before too long they would be forced to mobilize. Bart maintained to the contrary, quote, You forget the enormous power of a totalitarian state, and you forget that they are German workers. They will gladly fall in line. End quote. In the next weeks, we urged him to break his silence about political and church political events. Some freedom still existed. We were not yet accustomed to the oppression. He procrastinated. He had no inclination. Then he wrote a long manuscript. One evening, he read it to Charlotte von Kirschbaum and Helmut Traub. Traub relates that it was a completely political and unprecedentedly sharp manifesto. The two listeners immediately responded that it would be impossible to publish. The next day, he, the publisher, and the printer would all be sitting in prison. Angrily, he put the manuscript away. It no longer seems to exist. After a few days, he began writing again and had soon completed a new essay, which he once again read to the two. It was the now well-known first number of Theolog uh, Theologische Existenz heute. The two were enthusiastic and, besides that, satisfied that it could be published. Bart, however, enraged, threw the pages at their feet and left the room with the words, quote, There you have your politically coordinated theological existence, end quote. And just as an editorial note that Hunsinger gives us, the, lang the words that uh, get, uh, what we have there translated as politically coordinated is Gleitschgeschaltete, uh, and the slogan, uh, the noun form of that, Gleitschaltung, uh, was political coordination. It was a slogan of the Nazi regime about coordinating all areas of German life uh, with the Nazi regime. So Bart is making a very direct political reference there. So last paragraph. This incident from his life serves as a commentary on the conviction expressed in the foreword to Church Dogmatics 1.1, quote, that we cannot reach the clarifications, especially in the broad field of politics, which are necessary today and to which theology might have a word to say, as indeed it ought to have a word to say to them, without having previously reached those comprehensive clarifications in theology and about theology itself with which we should be concerned here, end quote. And, quote, that a better church dogmatics, even apart from all ethical utility, might actually make a more important and weightier contribution even to questions and tasks such as German liberation, than most of the well-intended material which so many, even among theologians, think they can and should produce when they dilettantishly take up such questions and tasks." End quote. What is here to be understood, along with the words politics and German liberation, is expressed by the path from Geneva to Safenville down to the, to the letter to Eberhard Bethke, and in summary is best expressed by that shop-worn and much abused, as the fierce reactions to it indicate, yet nonetheless useful word, socialism. You've been listening to the McCracken Cast. I am, and hopefully will remain, Dr. Travis McMacken. I do all the production work myself, in case you couldn't tell, but the music is by my son, Connor. Until next time, think interesting thoughts.